Uh, hi, so sorry, so sorry I'm late. Uh, if you can just give me a few minutes, I was transitioning from another class. I'll be joining you in the next one min two minutes actually. Sorry. All right, I see we have uh, 17 people in the room. I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, oh. uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Doc. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, so today is... This interaction, if you notice, this, this interaction was not really scheduled per se, um, but I, I thought it would be important for us to do some sort of, uh, the plan was to do a, two things actually that, that are pending. I thought I would give you an overview of, uh, just to give you pointers on where you might want to check out uh, what the state of the art is in this particular area of this field. Uh, I happen to have uh, a particular interest in this area. My, my master's was actually in, in digital libraries. There are certain aspects of my PhD that incorporated um, ideas borrowed from the field of digital libraries, right? Um, so part, part, of what, part of what I was hoping I could do is just walk you through what places or areas where you might find information about what's going on right now, right? Um, now I know, right, probably some of you are thinking, well, but we've already gone, we've already got into a certain stage in 5010. I'm not sure Dr. Kando has mentioned this, but the Topics that you're suggesting in 5010 are not set in stone. It's entirely possible that, in fact, once you do, there's, there's usually like a mini defense where you defend your proposal and um, staff from the department are invited to be a part of these interactions. And those that are expert in the areas, in the various areas, will point out um, certain important details. Like, for instance, if the topic you're proposing is not a topic worthy of the master's uh, research project, or if it's been done before, right? Uh, some people might insist that you, once you're allocated your supervisor, they might insist that you change the topic altogether. I've, I've done this, uh, I think I've done this with uh, almost two people that I call supervisor or supervise, right? Um, you know, so so this is, so part of what I'm, I was hoping you could do is just walk us through uh, what what we've been busy with, with some of the students I work with, and also what other people out there are doing, right? Where you can find information about what's going on. And there's a lot of exciting things going on, down from um, specific specific niche areas like uh, electronic thesis and dissertations, right? It, it, exciting things that are like last year, I attended uh, the so-called uh, electronic thesis and dissertation symposium, right? And um, I remember sitting in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this talk by people from Virginia Tech who, who were outlining um, a project they've been working towards. They're trying to see if they can use content you get from an ETD to summarize the different chapters. So you get that uh, maybe 200 page PhD thesis document. Can you summarize the contents of the different chapters, right? Which I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, I mean, there's research that is more aligned towards the user side of things, right? So usability of digital libraries, for instance, um, usefulness of digital libraries. And so so this was what uh, I thought we'd do. And I'd also mentioned that part of what we're going to do is to 
do some sort of sample walkthrough. And then someone had mentioned that maybe we do an installation. I don't know. We can try to see if we can do live installation. Although that would work better if you you were also able to do this, right? Like following through. In in an ideal case, like if it was face to face interaction, it would be like a workshop type interaction where we dedicated. We used to, last year and before last year, we dedicate an entire an entire afternoon or something where we we sit in a lab and then people are installing this space. And then I feel you have a challenge. Uh, I normally work with undergraduate students who walk around and then we help you fix the problems. And then in the process, by the time the session is done, you at least have a few of what you need to do to install the repository. But with an online type of arrangement, I guess what I would have to do is just show you exactly what to do, right? I don't know if we are able to successfully install the DSpace instance, but we'll try. So I'm going to propose that I start by just walking you through 6.5, right? And let's, if there are questions from yesterday before I start 6.5, the short uh, interaction where we get to talk about some publication venues and the major focus is going to be on what, what, what we are doing, some of the things we're doing. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Are there any questions with regards to what we did yesterday? Or was it clear or something? Well, if it was clear, so I'll start with just talking about some, so in the event, right, that you develop, you have some sort of inclination of doing research which is aligned with digital libraries and maybe if, maybe a topic you've, you're working towards right now has aspects of digital libraries. If you haven't come across these publication venues, I do encourage you to, to look up uh, these venues. These are usually, these are top tier publications in this field, right? Um, I'm sure you've discovered by now that these publication venues are ranked, right? So with the rapid increase of information that, that is being generated, you want to be very careful where you read information from, right? You want to make sure that obviously you avoid uh, so-called predatory journals, right? Um, it's always nice to read, uh, to read information from sources that you know undergo a very rigorous peer review process, not a venue where whatever publication is sent through to them, they'll publish, right? Typically these venues are normally interested in money, right? So as long as you can pay $100 or $50, they'll publish your work even if it's substandard. So um, the, the Network Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertation, right? The consortium runs a conference every year. Uh, this, this conference is specifically geared towards electronic thesis and dissertations. Last year it was in Portugal, this year it was supposed to be in Abu Dhabi, I think, I think so. Uh, but because of COVID-19, it's going to be a virtual conference. I think it's taking place sometime uh, in October or something, maybe November. So you want to be on the lookout, especially that it's going to be a virtual event. Um, the focus for this venue is just, uh, it, it is digital libraries, but with the particular emphasis on electronic thesis and dissertation. So, Usually people get to talk about the experiences implementing portals, for instance, national portals, the experiences with uh, uh, ideas that a lot, of, a lot of researchers, a lot of people, a lot of institutions struggle with. So things like self-archiving, right? Uh, I sat in, in a number of talks last year because I attended last, the conference from last year where there were a number of people that were discussing metadata, for instance, specific to electronic thesis and dissertations. So if you want to find out details, just go to the NDOTD uh, homepage, then you should be able to get to, you should be able to get to this section here that says past, past NDOTD conferences, right? Um, from here, you should be able to find, you should be able to see through and gain this this particular uh, hello
Uh, hello? Yes, Doc. Yeah, I, th I think I got disconnected. Some Someone was uh, trying to call me or something. I don't know why, but sorry. Uh, you were banking. Yeah, because yeah, someone, some character was trying to, I had to cancel that call. Uh, I'm not using my normal connection because I think I've used up my turbo allocation. So I'm tethering my phone. And so when somebody calls, obviously I, I lose connection. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, someone is saying the presentation is not shared. Can you see the presentation now? Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. So I was saying the NDOTD conference, right? Um, if you go to the NDOTD website um, and you 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 go to this part here that I've annotated, right? You should be able to, you will be able to see a list of past conferences. And I think this year is going to be the 22nd, if not the 21st. Uh, so if I say EDD, ETD Symposium. Um, so it's probably the 22nd. Last year, last year was the 20, 21st, and then the 2021 is meant to be, it's, it's going to be virtual anyway, but it's meant to be um, maybe in the United Arab Emirates. It's, it's, it's going to be, yeah, so when you go here, you should be able to see past conferences. This year, this year's is meant to be the 20, where is that part where it specifies the 22nd? I guess it doesn't say here, maybe if we go to, actually the web page, this mess. Right, oh, so it's going to be the 23rd because last year's was the 20, uh, Yeah, last year's was the 22nd, doesn't matter. So the, the key thing is that this, this event has been taking place for quite some time. So last year was the 22nd. Um, and so you should be able to find, if you develop an interest in electronic thesis and dissertation, this is a place to go. But besides this place, I think I have, uh, I have also, I don't know if people have, have seen this, but I have also in the past, <coughs> excuse me, I've sent out uh, emails, right? Forwarded emails from uh, uh, forwarded emails where emails that have originated from a certain a certain group. The same NDOTD has a group. There's a mailing list where there's wonderful information that is circulated, right? Um, and so that's another place to you. You probably want to subscribe if you've developed an interest in that ETD. Wow, is it not here? That's strange. I wonder if it's here. Uh, so, yeah, it's not here, ETD. I thought I, I had a... Um, in ETD. part of I know one is persistently trying to call me uh, let me just tell them I'm in class I don't know
Um, reason, let me start. Um, visit, right? Uh, you should be able to give you an idea of what 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 people are up to in so far as uh, research in this area is concerned. Um, right. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get to that mailing list, which is a bit strange. I know it's there somewhere. Um, it was, it's a Google group, which makes it a lot easier. Um, so. It was a bit weird. I, th I thought I, I had it somewhere, but very strange indeed. Yep. I thought I, yeah, it is a Google group. And I was searching for it just now, but I, I couldn't find, couldn't find it, which is a bit strange. It's a Google group. I guess the Google group interface is a bit strange. So if you're interested in this, um, and I know I'm a, I'm a member here and this stuff, you notice that it's, it's a very, it's a fairly active group actually, right? Uh, I was searching for ETD, but it's supposed to be ndotd.org, right? But, uh, so it's, it's a fairly active group. Uh, you can notice from the emails here. Um, and, and there's a lot of interesting interesting work associated with electronic thesis and dissertation. If this is up your alley, um, I, I do encourage you to, I do encourage you to look at this. Uh, you typically discover what the state of the art is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to if you if you if you visit this link here, you should be able to you should be able to have access to the group. It's the public group, um, and so if you go there, you can subscribe to that mailing list, right? All right, um, and then the other thing besides this is uh, there's there's a conference. It's it, uh, it's tagged as uh, it's it's tagged as uh, the International Conference on Asian Pacific Digital Libraries. But but the thing is, you typically have people from around the world that attend this event. I think the reason it's, it's given this name is because uh, it's probably conceived by people from that part of the world. But I've, I've, I've attended it once, I think, I attended it back in 20, it must have been 2012, 2013. Um, really interesting work. The beauty with this as well is you have people from from different fields that come together, right? So it's, it's a, you can view it as being a multidisciplinary type of conference where you have people that have a background in uh, information science, uh, a background in computing, background information systems, and so there's usually a lot of exciting, uh, exciting um, studies or research uh, publications that are normally presented here. All of these events, right? All of these events I'm talking about have corresponding proceedings that you can access publicly. So I know for a fact that ICADO normally publishes in, uh, is it Springer or the ACM Digital Library, right? So you should be able to gain access to the proceedings easily, right? So if you Google up um, uh, ICADO proceedings, I hope it's ACM or Springer. Uh, it's Springer, I guess. If you Google up ICADO proceedings, you notice here that uh, you have access to all the different years, right? So this is from 2019. And just by looking at the titles here, you, you gain a sense of what people are, are working towards, right? This will ensure that you focus on the state of the art, the current things that people are working on, not, 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 not proposing projects that were solved decades ago, right? This is why you want to read um, literature, current literature, and more importantly, literature from quote unquote authentic sources, reputable sources. And this is one of those sources. I do encourage you to, at the very least, take a peek at proceedings from last year. Uh, I think my, my alma mater, my lab, I guess there are people from the lab I used to be a part of that did some work. Uh, here's, the, here's the thing, right? Uh, digital libraries in the cloud. Uh, I know Lumba firsthand, we started, uh, we started our masters together, but he took a while to finish his masters. But but if you want to look up the, uh, these publications, I do encourage you to go to Springer. Right? Uh, and uh, and uh, visit this location. I have a question for you, right? 
I normally have this conversation. I don't know if I've had this conversation, but you notice that Springer is payward, right? Do you, um, Harry, do you have access to Spring at CBU? Mm. Wow, 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 wow. Do you have access to Spring from, at CBU? Well, uh, I wouldn't say yes or no. Mm. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, Sorry? Well, maybe. You really read, read, read access content. I don't. What do you mean? You, you wouldn't say yes or no. What, what would you say then? Okay. What, what, maybe you can just uh, clarify the, the statement. Okay. W would you, at CBU, would you yeah. be able to access that when you log on to CBU servers? Would you be able to access that article? It's, it's pretty, you typically, as, a, as like, like, I guess, as institutions, right? UNSA subscribes to certain journals, right? Yes, yes. Right? Academic databases like Elsevier, for instance, Springer. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So yes. you notice that this. So you yes, have access have, to Springer? Yes, we have access to all those databases that you mentioned, even Springer. Okay, because UNSA doesn't, I don't think UNSA subscribes to Springer anyway, but I know some Elsevier databases. Uh, yes. Yes, I normally have this. Yeah. I have this. Springer yeah. and the others. Okay, that's good. Uh, how about mm -hmm. the others? How do you access this article? If it's paywall, do you have a way of accessing it? Okay, you can do like, uh, there is, uh, like Emerald. We, you, yeah. These are lined up uh, databases. So you just go to the to the menu. Then you select the one you want to, to, to use. And you click on it and then it's going to open depending on the subject matter that you are looking at. And then it's going to ask, it's going to tell you to accept. And then you say accept, okay. and then it's going to open. Okay. Yes. Miss Sipo, where, where is work? Pardon? I, I work at CBU. No, I, I was asking Miss Sipo, I see Sipo. Uh, uh, where is work? Mulungushi University. Right. Do you have, uh, thank you, I know I interacted with, uh, what's his name again? He Kelly? Came through for our, sorry? Is it Kelly? No, he's in oh, the Henry. library. Henry, Henry, Henry. Yes. Yes, yes Henry. Um, yes. Do, do, you, do you have access to Spring at Mungushi? No, we don't. So what would you do if, uh, if, I, if, if you were to access that article? Now here's a question. I'm leading up to something. I, I normally have this conversation okay. with people, right? About uh, and I, I think some of you know about this. I don't know if I've mentioned this before. This idea of um, uh, you, you know that there's this debate that's raging, right? Very, very recently, I think is it MIT? They've um, they've opted out out of uh, an agreement with uh, is it Osevi or something? Uh, let me check. Um, Osevi. I don't know if you follow up on this. MIT. Uh, yes. Uh, how is very recently, right? Um, very recently, um, you see this negotiation. Isn't, I think this is it. You probably want to read this now. I can't, but the, there's this movement, right? There's this idea that uh, it doesn't make sense that light on, right? This is light on now. This is me. Uh, if you look at one of my publications, is with uh, I'll save you, right? Um, and one of the journals, anyway, computers and education. Um, and if I, if I want to access this document, right? If I wanted to access this document, it's paywall right now, right? If I was to want, if I was to gain, if I wanted to gain access to this, you see what they are saying. Does, it probably doesn't subscribe to this particular journal, right? I, I'm not sure, but I would need to pay $24, right? Now, there are people that are against this, right? There are people that feel, and I don't know how you feel about this, right? The, I don't want to have this conversation with students I work with and, and, and whatnot, but and colleagues sometimes. There are people that feel very strongly about this, right? The idea that it doesn't make sense that I do the day to work, but I do a lot back of my work, just like most researchers, just like you will very soon. But when you need access to a, an article, you need to pay money, substantial amount of money, right? If you look at the link that I told you about, the spring articles I told you about, one article here, as an individual, if you, if you don't work for an organization that subscribes to this, you need to pay what? 24.95 euros, right? Which is, this is very, very sad, right? 
<laughs> now, now, there are, uh, hmm. there are people that feel very strongly about this, and there are people that have become adamant, there are people that are, I guess you could call them, um, they've gone rogue, right? Um, and, and part of what they've done is they're saying, well, we'll make these things illegally available. Have you, have people heard about Sci-Hub? Has Dr. Kandula mentioned, have you had the discussion about Sci-Hub? Anybody, do you, you know about Sci-Hub, right? Maybe we're going around with take calls here. Do you know about Sci-Hub? No. Anyone know about So the idea behind Sci-Hub, right, is that, um, the idea behind Sci-Hub is that, uh, people have decided to say, you, if you if you are unable to access an article, right, you can just uh, illegally access it, even if it's paywall, the vast majority of paywall articles, you can access them by just going to Sci-Hub. So observe. Now, if I, I'm not saying, I don't know how you feel about this, which is why I'm, I'm raising it, right, even though we're not talking about this, but, <laughs> but I'm raising it because I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. So this, here is like when it comes from a university which doesn't have enough resources to subscribe to this database because it's expensive. It's so damn expensive, and so what my employers do is they prioritize, they've identified uh, venues that they think they can subscribe to and the vast majority of the university community will be able to find what they want, right? Books and journals and whatnot. So if I don't, if, if my university does not subscribe to that, what I can do, now I'm not saying I do this myself, is I go to Sci-Hub and then, then I'll gain access to um, to the article, right? Now, now the thing with what's happening here is, there's different ways of looking at this, right? Now, number one, the question to ask is, is this ethical, right? Is, is it ethical for you to illegally, to illegally access content that you otherwise would have to pay money for? That's one way of looking at it. Um, is it stealing, right? Are, are, you, are you stealing, and if you're stealing, is this morally right or something? But I'll leave it up to you to decide. I don't know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Um, this is not the first time this movement has started, right? Um, I don't know if people have heard of, I normally talk about Aaron, what's his name, Aaron Jesto. Aaron, from, I keep forgetting his name. He, is, he was a, a, a um, it, it became somewhat of a martyr, right? Um, Aaron Swartz, uh, a couple of years ago, I don't know how many years it has been, he hacked into Jesto servers, downloaded, um, downloaded, payload material, right, he died in 2013, he hanged himself. So he downloaded payload material and made it publicly available, right? Um, and because of like a pending court case that was there, he decided to hang himself. He was, he was 26 years of age anyway. So, so there is interesting ideas that people talk about and, and, and I think these are things that, that, um, that we don't normally talk about. Occasionally, myself, I will, um, uh, you probably want to read up on Aaron Swartz or something. Occasionally, right, I talk to some of my colleagues about this, right, and I'll give you an example of conversations that I vividly remember because I use these as examples when I'm talking about this. So, um, if I read, uh, I'm, surprised, I'm surprised that people have not read about this. Right? This is very strange. I think they should be shooting some people that are that, uh, yeah, okay. attacking for me. Uh, 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 okay. 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 Right, so I want to just give you an example of like a conversation. Yeah, there we go. This is an old thing from two years ago, right? So a colleague of mine, right? this person is based in. Um, I think he's based, he works at uh, UCT or something, right? So he, he says, uh, this is wonderful news for scholars based in Africa, right? For the first time, the overwhelming ma majority of scholarly li literature is available for free to anyone with internet connection. Now, now this for free, right? He neglects to mention that this is illegal. It could be perceived as being illegal, right? And my response, I remember to this, there was an interesting conversation I had with him along with other people that found this interesting. And I was asking questions like, is it ethical, right? 
to access such legal content? How do you, I'm interested, how do you, how would you, how do you feel about this, though, by the way? What are your thoughts on this? I mean, do you think it's something, do you do this, actually? Uh, I think that, that is illegal, because, uh, you know, knowledge has got value. Okay. And uh, it, 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 it right. okay. people that have contributed to this uh, intellectual you know, property. And then you, they need to be paid for. So now, okay. if you just put it on a public domain. Well, actually, uh, actually, actually, I'm not, here's the thing. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. The research that the average, uh, the, the, the publications, the studies that the average researcher does is paid for by taxpayers' money. Yeah. They, they, don't get, they don't get much from there. Most of the money goes to the publishing houses. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, by the way. So let's not get uh, things twisted here. The vast majority of uh, the money goes to these publishing houses, not to researchers. Right? I'll give you an example of uh, articles that I've published, right? I'll, I'll, here's the thing. I'll say I have an article in a journal, which is how, I guess, which is owned by Elsevier, for instance. I don't get money from here. I get zero. I, I've never got any penny from here. The people that benefit from whoever purchases using this amount, right? All of this money goes to this journal. And the argument that this, these publishing houses will say is that, well, we are doing you a favor by making your work visible, right? That's the argument that they'll make. So you're not paying the researcher per se, you're paying the publishing house. Now, I don't know, I, I, I thought I would mention it there, right? I, I, when I have this conversation with my students, I always say, I always ask, right, what, what do you do when you're doing a literature review and you find an article that is paywalled, right? Do you, and if you think it's interesting and closely tied to what you want to do, what are you going to do? Are you just going to abandon it and, and, and hope that you'll find related literature that is not paywalled, right? Now, these are things to think about. Fortunately for other fields, like, uh, I guess, fields like ours in computing and, I guess, information science, it's almost always the case that when you reach out to these individuals, you write to them, right? You write to them and ask for a preprint. They will send you a preprint. But what people are increasingly doing here is, and by the way, if you look up a Sci-Hub usage map, what people are increasingly doing is they're going there, they've gone rogue, right? So if you look at articles that have been written in uh, SciMag magazine, for instance, here, they did a map to try and figure out where most people come from, the people that are accessing this content illegally by going, uh, because Harriet is suggesting that it's illegal, um, which I don't know if it's illegal, but if you look at the map, right, what this map is, it shows you where most of these people are coming from, which is really interesting. It's interesting to see that um, there's actually a number of people, right, especially in the global north, the so-called global north anyway, that are actually using this service, right? So I just, I put it out there in the event that uh, if you want to access Springer, which is paywall, right? And I know this conversation is being uh, recorded here, but if you want to access Springer, which is paywall, and you don't feel strongly about accessing illegal content, there's services like Sci-Hub, right? Uh, they've tried to take them down. There's, they usually pop up every now and then. So I, I do encourage you to read up on this as well. Um, these are conversations that researchers actually from around the world they will be are having. The, the, there's certain schools of thoughts that believe that uh, there's nothing wrong in doing this. Now, um, I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know if everyone agrees with Harriet here, but, but that's that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there we go, Springer, right? So ICADO, you'll find the proceedings online. Um, the same goes for TPDL. Now, the idea behind TPDL is this, usually the angle taken here is more from a computer science point of view. It's more theoretical, right? So most of the content, the vast majority of the content that you, hide, you, you come across in TPDL um, will be more technical in nature. But there's no harm in visiting TPDL. TPDL for this year, because of COVID-19, is going to be virtual. Because it's going to be virtual, it's likely that um, access will be waived, right? So you want to be on the lookout, go to that link and then just poke around and try and see if you you come across anything interesting, maybe the keynote speakers, or it could be some specific 
uh, presentations that are going to be given, right? It turns out that um, part of, part of learning, a way of effectively picking up on what is happening, what people are doing is listening to what they're doing rather than reading wildly, right? I'll give you an example of some proceedings like Springer, for instance. What you would discover is that uh, in a given session, you typically find um, maybe almost 50, maybe 70 presentations, right? Now, it's not possible that you'll be able to read all of those presentations, but sitting in on some of the talks that are linked to what you're interested in might help you identify the state of the art, right? So if you look at the different topics from last year's um, uh, ICADO conference, you notice that there are people that were looking at uh, text classification, which is computer science centric, obviously. Things like alternative metrics to use to gauge, um, uh, to gauge um, impact of research. These are called alt metrics, right? There are people that think that uh, how many people are tweeting awake, how many people are blogging about awake can, can be used as a measure of how impactful you are. I'm not just using metrics like, uh, or the H index or how many people cited me. I don't know if you've discussed or you've come across alternative metrics, what metrics? There's a strong movement, there's, uh, there's, um, what metrics? There's, um, there's a site, impact, impact factor. I don't know if people have come across impact factor, actually, impact factor, where if, if you create a profile, uh, is that impact factor? Ooh, what metrics? Impact, impact story. I think if you if you if you create a profile, what what impact story does is they keep track of um, how many people are tweeting your work, how many people are are sharing your work, how many people have uh, cited your work on SlideShare and whatnot. Um, and there are some 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 places out there that actually. Um, would use that, right, as a basis to, to sort of like gauge whether or not your research has been impactful, not just rely on, um, oh, and not just rely on, oh, how many people have cited you, what, what H index do you have, what H5 index do you have, right? So I haven't updated this in a while, but you notice that if I look at some of my publications, I have a tweet here, right, oh, one tweet, um, uh, I guess, uh, there are certain metrics that, that these are unconventional metrics, right? Now, all of these things here, which is, I wonder if there are more unconventional metrics here, but these unconventional metrics are, are linked to this subfield that I was pointing you towards called alt metrics, right? So if you're interested in that area, you'd read this particular content here, right? If you're interested in uh, square research output, you'd be interested in this area. If you have an inclination towards metadata, what I'm saying is you don't have to read everything from, from the ICAD or proceedings. You can select topics that you are interested in. If you're interested in information retrieval or search engines, you go here, right? And the reason you want to do that is because you have access to more than just last year's proceedings. You can actually navigate to the proceedings from previous years, right? So 2019, 2018, 2017, all the way up to the beginning. Okay. Um, I do encourage you to go here. I, I is quite good because it's um, it's it's not. It has a it, it, there's a balance. If you look at work published there, there's there's a balance between research that appears in uh, well, research that is aligned to more technical fields to research that is more uh, uh, more on the user side of things, right? If you're interested in metadata, so there's there's, there's a bit of diversity there. Okay, uh, TPDA on the other hand, um, more technical, but still it doesn't hurt, it wouldn't hurt for you to, to just uh, take a peek and look at what people are up to there. Um, but besides that, there's also the JCDL, uh, it's probably top on the food chain so far as digital library research is concerned. Um, it's going to be virtual this year as well. And funny enough, it was supposed to be held in uh, Wuhan, right? Where the virus supposedly originated from. But again, if you go here, you should be able to get to the link where you have access to the proceedings, past proceedings. I know that uh, work in JCDO is usually published in the SEM Digital Library. Sadly, that is paywalled as well. So you'd have to keep your fingers crossed and hope that your institution will be like CBU who perhaps will have a subscription to SEM, uh, JCDL. 
Uh, if not, then uh, you'd have to maybe do some soul searching and ask yourself, is it legal to, yeah, SCM, is it, would it be okay, would God forgive me if I illegally accessed content to, I mean, from, um, from, from the SCM digital library, right? I wonder if God would, would be, I don't know, but anyway, uh, so I'm going to share this as well. You want to visit the CDL. Again, if you look at the actual proceedings, they usually, uh, the interface has changed here, but the proceedings are usually, there we go. The sessions are usually broken down based on the different fields. So if you look at the sessions here, right? Uh, collection, bind, building, collection access and indexing, citation analysis, scientific collections and libraries, you know, quality and preservation, text collections. The key thing here is the underlining theme in all these different publication venues I'm pointing you towards is that you'll be able to figure out the state of the art. Important, quote unquote, important problems that people are working on, right? Um, you don't want to start proposing problems with non-solutions, solutions that were proposed 20 years ago. Okay, uh, but besides that, um, there's also the, the premier uh, journal, which is International Journal of Digital Libraries. <laughs> Sadly, this is also indexed by Springer. Uh, so for you to gain access to, to this, you probably need a subscription, I think, unless if the publication has been explicitly published um, via the open access route. And this is possible for most publication venues where authors are willing to pay money so that their work is available by an open, uh, open, open access license. Right? Um, but besides these specific venues where you'll be able to find state of the art work that people are working on, you can use Google, right? And, and, and I'm sure Dr. Kandero has introduced the idea of back chaining and forward chaining when you're looking for resources, right? So you can identify um, a key publication that you think is influences what you're proposing to do, and then you can do like forward chaining to see who has cited it, and then try and read uh, up on the most recent work that has cited that work, right? Um, and the idea is you'll be able to narrow down on an important area by doing that. All right, so I, I do encourage you to visit most of these venues, right? Wonderful venues. Um, but I thought uh, before I talk about some other research groups that you might want to, to visit and, and read up on their publications, I thought I would, I would walk you through some, some things that we've been doing with the students that I work with. So, so beginning, is it beginning last year or something, we set up this really informal group, right, which we are calling the Data Lab Research Group, right? The, and, 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 and really, uh, it's composed, loosely composed of students that I either co-supervise or supervise. Uh, it's quite small because I only just started supervising or working with postgraduate students um, in 20, was that 2019? Um, 2019. Uh, and so at the, at the moment, um, I'm working with a total of about four, four master's students who I'm supervising or co-supervising. Um, but the underlying theme uh, with what they're doing is they work in these three areas that I'm interested in, right? So um, it's either data mining, digital libraries, or technology enhanced learning. And I, I thought I'd just focus on uh, the digital library aspect to try and walk you through some of the problems that we've been attempting to resolve here, right? So if you visit that link here, you should be able to get to, um, to, to a very basic website that has a list of all the students that are part of that group. And um, those that have graduated, this is mostly 40 years because it's it only takes them a year to work towards their study. Um, and also some reports and publications that have been published that have come out of here, right? Um, so some, some of the things we've done really is, uh, I mean, we've, we've, we've mostly been, so far as digital libraries is concerned, we've mostly been obsessing a lot about um, how we can in increase the online visibility of research content, right? Uh, and so, so far, uh, what we've done, we've, we've done sort of like situation analysis where we've figured out that there's, there's a number of things that have sort of like contributed to the low online visibility of research output online, right? So if you're interested in, um, in reading up more on what we've done here, I'm just going to walk you through some of the things we've done. 
there's work that is about to be published um, where we, we are proposing an automated way of, of ingesting content into institutional repositories. So the idea behind what we are proposing here is that um, if you look at how things are currently done in your average university, you typically have individuals uh, in a particular, or in a unit of a library of an institution of higher learning that will manually prepare metadata and ingest into the repository. Now, this is a time consuming task, one that takes uh, a substantial amount of time. Uh, interviews that have been conducted with people at UNSA seem to suggest that the average is anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes for one object, right? Now, this is not sustainable, especially if you have um, very few individuals that are dedicated towards that task. And so what we've proposed is, um, is, is really a way of automatically classifying the metadata so that you, you, can, you can automatically generate some of the metadata elements, thus cutting down on the amount of time that people have to, have to spend preparing the metadata and then ingesting it into the repository. Now, the idea behind what we're doing is we're not saying we are getting rid of the people that do this, but rather they instead play the crucial role of verifying that what has been automatically generated actually makes sense. Um, a, a while back, uh, we had a group of fourth years, that was in 2018, that um, we were interested in investigating whether it would be feasible to set up uh, a subject institutional repository or subject institutional repository at the University of Zambia. Um, and the reasoning behind this is to try and decentralize the way ingestion into the repository currently takes place. So rather than have an institution-wide repository, can we create these uh, silos of repositories in, the, in different schools, for instance, and then have them uh, ingest content in the unit in the library that is responsible for this would just be there to verify that the content that is being deposited into the subject repository is actually correct, right? Um, of course, I'm, I'm sure as you'd have guessed here, um, protocols such as the OIPMH and REST APIs come in handy here because they would make it a lot easier to synchronize content from the subject institution repository to the institution-wide repository, right? If you're interested in reading up on what uh, these guys did, you're welcome to go here. And by the way, one of the outputs of what they did is, uh, I hope it's online, is this uh, departmental archive, right? This portal, this list portal. So if you go here, um, you should be able to find research that is generated by faculty staff in the Department of Library Information Science and also Capstone Project Reports. Right, so the idea behind this is just decentralize um, management of uh, the institution repository. Uh, last year, um, we had a group of students that were interested in trying to figure out if using subject controlled vocabulary sets would result in more effective institutional repositories, right? Um, so the reasoning behind this is that your average institution of higher learning will typically have square research output that is coming from various disciplines. Now, those different disciplines will typically use different subject controlled vocabulary sets. So rather than use a generic um, uh, vocabulary like um, the Library of Congress subject heading, which is what the UNSA uses, um, can, can we take a more focused approach where you, you identify the controlled vocabulary sets that are specific to the different disciplines and then integrate them with the repository? And this, this would make sense if you think about it, if you, you came up with a situation where you have these different subject repositories for each school, right? Because what you would do is integrate all those different subject repositories with specific controlled vocabulary sets, right? Um, very superficial study that they conducted to assess the effectiveness or the efficacy of controlled vocabulary sets. Um, it turned out that obviously, I mean, uh, in, in terms of usability, integrating a repository with a controlled vocabulary set yields a more usable or results in a more usable repository uh, when combined with one that doesn't use any controlled vocabulary set. Uh, obvious things that came out is uh, obvious when you're ingesting content, you, take, you tend to take a short period of time to ingest content than you would uh, if you have no controlled vocabulary set. Because what you'd have to do is literally find the text you want to do, maybe copy paste it somewhere or just type it in, right? Uh, so again, if you're interested in finding out more um, about what they did, you're welcome to go there. 
Uh, I've been working with uh, Angela Banda since last year. She's a master's student. This is a fourth year project. This is a fourth year project. Um, Angela is, is interested in, in, in experimenting with workflows that would result in more effective ingestion of content into the repository. Uh, and the pr premise behind our work um, stems from the fact that if you look at content in the UNSA repository right now, you'll notice that there's a bit of inconsistent, inconsistency in the frequency at which content is ingested into the repository, right? So if you do a simple comparison between ingestion dates and publication dates, what you notice is that we are still in the process of uploading content that was published many, many years ago. We have a backlog of content. And so the thinking behind our work is, can we, can we look at this, right? This was work that was uh, published in uh, 2017, right? But um, it was only ingested in 2020, if you notice the date here, 2020, it was published in 2017. So her thinking is, can we, right? Can we come up with effective workflows that would reduce this turnaround time? Ensure that when something is published, let's say in 2020, maybe in July, at the very least, it should be available in the repository by maybe in the following month, right? Or perhaps sooner, you know? There's no reason why this can't be done, right? Uh, if you're interested in finding out more on what Angela has been up to, no work has been published yet, but very recently um, we had a, um, we had a, uh, we normally have annual, annual talks in the, in the lab where people, uh, returning students will give an update on what they've been up to and um, the new students who will do proposal presentations of what they're proposing to do, right? So Angela, I think uh, I, I think there should be a talk here. I do encourage you to, it's a short talk, just 30 minutes. Um, you're welcome to go there and uh, play back this, this uh, talk by Angela, uh, which should give you a sense of what she's, Angela Banda, of what she's working towards. All right, um, and our emphasis, by the way, is on ETDs here, trying to improve the workflow of ETDs. By the way, currently, the, when, you gra when, you want, when you are done with your research, you will, you will submit on CD an electronic copy of your ETD. You will take it to DRGS. So you do your defense, you're told make these corrections, if DRGS verifies the corrections, they tell you go and bind your work, bring the copies, three copies, and an electronic copy on CD. At some stage, DRGS will, <clears throat> excuse me, DRGS will compile the submitted ETDs and then they'll take them to the library. The library will start preparing metadata associated with the ETDs and then start ingesting them into the repository. So the thinking behind what Angela is suggesting is, can we, can we take advantage of self-archiving and, and maybe try and reduce the amount of time spent during all these different phases of the workflow, right? You probably want to play back that talk, really interesting talk. Um, and then this year I'm working with a group of students who are supposed, I haven't really been making steady progress here, but they, they're supposed to, to, um, to see or to investigate, um, to, to investigate the possibility of improving the quality of metadata associated with ETDs as they ingested into the repository. Uh, there is a prescribed standard called ETDMS that is supposed to be used when you're encoding ETDs with metadata, right? So you just don't encode it with generic metadata. The prescribed scheme is ETDMS. Um, and so we're trying to see if we can improve the quality, right? By identifying things like the mandatory fields of um, uh, the ETD metadata. Um, this is actually, this, this work is actually similar to what I was mentioning here, right? Uh, what we did here is just implemented uh, classification models, really. We took a machine learning approach where we just build models that automatically generate metadata, right? So instead of having a human being uh, type the metadata, you read the abstract and the title, 
we've, we've, we've implemented uh, machine learning models that automatically generate these things, right? And so the human being, the people in the library would come in and just verify to say, the thing that the machine has generated actually makes sense. Now, to give you an example of what would actually happen here, I can, we've deployed these machine learning models, by the way, so I can, uh, I hope I'll be able to do this, but, uh, I can show you an example of, I, I hope it's there, but I can show you an example of, um, of, of how this would work. <clears throat> Although the idea is to build layered services on top, right? On top of the machine learning models. Uh, but to give you an example, let's say we wanted to classify, uh, it's the body or something, I don't know. Yeah, so I wanted to classify this ETD here. We'd get the title, right? And the abstract, and then feed it to the model. The machine learning model will be able to give you back an output. I don't know if people can see an output. It's going to come somewhere at the bottom here. The machine learning model should be able to give you an output and be able to determine whether the, the text that you supplied, the, ET, the text associated with ET that you want to, uh, to classify, uh, corresponds to the correct collection. It's just taking time, but uh, it should be able to come up <coughs> very, very soon. But, but so what we've done so far is the models we've implemented are able to automatically classify subjects, the collection, um, and also the type of the ETD. Um, we are currently trying to explore the possibility of seeing if we can automatically generate ETDMS metadata elements, which is it's an easy thing to do. There's nothing new there, right? Uh, well, there are some aspects that are somewhat new, but there's nothing complex. It's an easy thing to do. <coughs> um, I don't know if this is making sense, I'm gonna to pause to see if people are online, actually. Am, am I making sense? You're following, I hope. Uh, yes, no? Okay, I see you. Yes, it is making sense, Doc. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm like, some of these things, right? This thing that I'm talking about, they sound, they sound like complex, like, oh, machine learning models. What people are doing, what other librarians out there are doing is this is what they're doing. This is the state of the art now. Right? This is no longer stuff that people with a computing background are doing. It's become so mainstream that people from these other disciplines um, are able to do this, right? <clears throat> so this is, these are things to think about. And think about this for a second. If you're going to do something for one year, why not learn some, a new skill that is completely new, right? right? So um, what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say is, uh, some of the things I'm talking about might sound a bit intimidating, but, um, but guess what? I mean, this is something you can do and something that you can learn in less than a month, actually. But anyways, uh, I'm working with Robert. Robert is a computer science student. His, his interest is to take this a step further. What we are doing here is automatically classifying ETDs. What he's trying to do is build machine learning models that are able to classify all the different types of objects, right? So if you have an institutional repository like the OZA repository uh, that stores Preprints, journal articles, conference papers, book chapters, books, ETDs, student reports. Can we build machine learning models that are able to classify all these different types? Right? This is what he's working towards. Uh, we haven't really had any publications uh, out of this. And sadly for Robert, uh, he didn't give a talk this, this year, right? I don't know what happened there. So, uh, um, a shame. I wonder if I can invite him to give a talk next week or something. All right, so this is what I was talking about. Some of the things I think of doing this year is to try and see if we can build models that are able to automatically generate DMS uh, metadata elements. It's, it's not that hard. Uh, the, the, one of the grand plans we have is we have, um, we have uh, a prototype of a portal, right? It's, we call it, we're calling it the Zambia National ETD, ETD portal. Uh, that is available right now. And we've, we've, we've actually figured out that it's actually feasible, feasible for us to build this portal, right? We have a prototype version where now gradually, I don't know if you can see this, we are now wanting to, to take this to production. We set it up, um, and it's been long overdue actually, but we're trying to set it up so that uh, we can have other universities, Mungushi University, Unilas, Copper Belt, or Copper Belt University is still there, although there's just one, eight, 168 objects here. So you can have all these universities to synchronize their content here. 
so that if there's anyone in Zambia who is interested in accessing research that postgraduate students do, masters and PhD students, rather than go to these individual universities, you come to this unified interface and then you search for what you want, right? It's not just uh, other students, it's NGOs. It is policymakers like government universities, right? So uh, the grand plan is to take this to production. It's, it's been taking a bit of time here, I guess, because um, well, the progress has stalled, but the, the last remaining bit is just to come up with a domain name and reach out to Zamarin so that they, they host this platform for us for free and then boom, it will be up and running. But right now it works just fine. If you want to take a look at this, you're welcome to, uh, to go there, so Zambia ETD portal prototype. You can go there and then you'll be able to access the portal there. Um, you can search, you can browse, right? But the only thing is, if you remember, what we do is we just harvest metadata here, right? And because you're harvesting metadata, for you to access the original article, you'd have to, to click the hyperlink and go to the actual, <clears throat> and go to the actual, um, the actual institution, right? Uh, so yeah, anyway. Um, what else? Uh, now, I don't know if there are any questions, but if not, are there any questions so far? We want to wait until I talk about the last bit here. Not that I expect questions because I was just trying to give you an overview of uh, the state of the art what we are, what I am personally involved with, I happen to have an interest in, in three key areas. If you look at my, my academic career dating back from 2011, I've been conducting research in these three broad areas, right? So most of my publications are here. Um, my PhD, or my master's was in here. My PhD was in technology enhanced learning. Uh, what I do currently is it involves all these three areas, right? Uh, so anyway, um, if there are no questions then, I just want to point out that there are certain people out there, smaller groups that are similar to what we call at UNSA the data lab that are doing similar things, but perhaps their focus is somewhat different. Um, I was part, for years, I was part of the digital library research group at UCT. Um, in as much as it's called the digital libraries research laboratory, but it's made up of uh, faculty staff that have an interest in things like ontologies, for instance, digital libraries and information retrieval. <clears throat> so if you go to the publication page, what you will notice is that while there is some research on digital libraries, but you also find uh, research on uh, areas like information retrieval, for instance, which is quite interesting really. Um, so, and by the way, our next module is on information retrieval. So if you're interested in that area, I mean, even though I don't do research in that area, but maybe I could attempt to do something, we can attempt to cover out something that's linked to information retrieval. But anyway, uh, so the Digital Libraries Research Group, uh, what you will soon find is it's made up of, uh, last time I checked it was two or three staff or something. Uh, these are the members of staff. Uh, a whole slew of students, right? Uh, mostly masters and PhD students. Um, but uh, this is an odd mark should I should change it of mine. But so also what you want to do is you want to visit their publication page, right? Because what this publication page will have is a list of most recent research publications that they have done. And you can literally see that there's a mixture of information retrieval, social network analysis, there's digital libraries, right? Um, anyways. Wow, I didn't, uh, I haven't trade up on most recent work done. I see there's a lot of work here. But anyway, besides this, other groups where uh, I, I seem to feel there is a digit, digital library centric research going on that might be relevant to um, the Zambian scene is uh, the digital libraries research group at Virginia Tech, right? Um, you probably want to visit this, a lot of interesting work. There, what you will see, you know, when you visit most of these groups is you notice that uh, there's increasingly a focus on how we get to make sense out of large scale data because of the sheer amount of data that we're generating, right? Gone are the days where you'd be working with a collection with just 100 objects, right? Scale has become important now. 
Um, but also, the Old Dominion University has uh, a web science and digital libraries research group. I do encourage you to visit their group, uh, some really interesting work that they do there, right? Um, right, so I, I don't know if, um, if that was a good enough uh, overview of the state of the art, uh, the sort of things that I've personally been involved with uh, the last couple of years, and also other groups out there. Uh, this is, by, by the way, this is not comprehensive. There are a number of groups that do digital library-centric research, right? These are just uh, a few selected groups that have people that have bumped in, into in these uh, events that I attend, right? Conferences, when I attend conferences, I'm always on the lookout of uh, what people are doing, right? So I, I've, I've noticed like interesting work that is coming from this area. Of course, I mean, I would say there's interesting work coming from here because I spent some seven years, um, almost six, seven years, um, in this research group, right? So I, I don't know if you have any specific questions. Uh, I'm looking at the time here. Okay, we have a bit of time. Are there any questions with open research questions, like venues and what we do as a data lab research group? And I don't know. Uh, hello? Am I, am I still connected or have I lost my connection? Are, are people still there? Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. Uh, oh, so there are no questions then, right? We are trying to assimilate what you've learned, you know, trying to make sense out of it. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it took me a while to realize yeah. the importance of, uh, of reading up on what people are doing. The approach, I worked with, I worked very closely with, um, with a person who has probably a probably there could be no questions. Yeah. But uh, maybe just to look it up, like maybe the interest could be knowing more on what you're sharing because it could be a new thing, probably to most of us, and we are basically learning. And mm -hmm. so okay. we need to know more about what it is that you're presenting. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, this was uh, just a just a quick and dirty way of just showcasing. I guess you could call this like uh, the current DO landscape, right? DO research landscape. Uh, I guess the key takeaway point here is that uh, you can view digital libraries from so many different um, aspects or angles. You can cover out your research from the user side of things. Um, you can cover out your research from a more technical perspective, um, from an aspect where you get to implement things, right? Like Angela, what Angela is doing is she literally has to modify the dispersed workflow. Right, you modify the dispersed workflow and come up with a workflow that that best fits the current DRGS workflow. Where uh, the current workflow for DRGS, by the way, is such that um, I hope I have an email somewhere. I don't know if I have an email somewhere, but I do. But, uh, uh, but, uh, so, so currently, uh, yeah. yes, hi, yes, hi. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I lost you. Yeah. Um, my research, I just wanted like to make an update on, the, on, on research, my research, because you mentioned to say some of you could be doing a, a research similar to what uh, we're discussing. Um, mine is based on uh, information and literacy instruction uh, practices. And uh, most of the literature review that I came across was talking about uh, the same digital libraries or how uh, librarians can teach postgraduate students, undergraduate students uh, on how to uh, search for information using uh, databases. So it's quite interesting with what you, you've you discussed with us. Right, okay. Yeah, I know we have, uh, yeah, I'm trying to see who, who is an expert when it comes to information which was, I don't know if it's, uh, is it Mrs. Zhu or something or, who is it? Who teaches information literacy? We do have a course tied to that, right? Uh, I know I don't. I don't. Ah, do we, are, we are not sure. We don't know if it's there. No, but I, but I know there we are do. people that do research in. Uh, mm, hello, Doc. 
I think it's uh, it's there. Undergraduates are doing it. I don't know about it. Yeah. So, so no, so not just doing not just at undergraduate level. But what I mean but is, you see, what, the people in the department. That's, that's the what, I, that's what I did at uh, undergraduate. That was my research. Who, who supervised you? It's Mrs. Zulu. Yeah, so I thought I thought as much. It has to be Mrs. Zulu. So again, if you go to our document archive, you can get a sense of uh, what sort of things people are up to. Look at this. Is, it, is there literates? Literates, we have two, right? Two publications. Let's mm -hmm. see who supervises these people, right? Uh, mm. Yeah, this is Mrs. Zulu here. Uh, but from my knowledge, uh, Unza had a department which, uh, according to my information, is no longer there. Information and literacy department. Yeah, no, no, but, but I mean, uh, looking at literacy from a perspective of information science here. So what the way this works, right? Yeah. And the way the matchmaking works, uh -huh. once you propose a proposal, at least this is how it works at UNSA, or in our department, which I've always thought is very strange. Based on what you're interested in, mm. the postgraduate coordinator will compile the titles and then he will reach out to people that are in a position to supervise and say, we have these students, these are the areas that they're interested in. Uh, to spread out the supervision, can you can you signal your interest on what you're interested in, right? Oh, and then so okay. if you are, if you propose something to do with literacy, I can't I can't supervise that because I have I don't I don't do research in information and literacy, um, okay. and so the best person who who probably uh, decide to say I think I want to provide this to someone like Mrs. Zulu because Mrs. Zulu does making literacy, right? Now, this makes sense because think about this for a second, right? The last thing you want to do is to work with someone who's not knowledgeable in the area, who has not done research in that area. Because one of the things that a supervisor is supposed to do is to guide you, to mm -hmm. tell you to say, go and read this. And a person will be able to tell you, go and read this if they've done extensive research in that area, right? So, mm -hmm. like, I, I never, if you look at the people I'm supervising, for instance, right? Um, None of them, I mean, are doing anything that is unrelated to these, these, these things. Here. All of them are doing research in digital libraries, data mining, or technology history. Why? Because I have a morbid curiosity in these, these things. I'm interested in these areas. I dedicate a lot of my time in these areas. I, I would like to think I've read extensively in these areas. I have done research in these areas, right? So I understand. I, I can. I know exactly where you should look for information in the event that maybe you are interested in exploring maybe metadata, for instance. Right? So, mm. so yeah, uh, there is little I can do to comment on literacy, but I'm sure Mrs. Blue should be able to, to guide there. Uh, but what's interesting is, I guess, looking at it from the perspective of digital libraries, I don't know. Uh, okay. uh, are there any other questions? What, what what titles do you have, by the way? I haven't. What, what topics are you working on? You guys literally. Okay, like for me, my title is uh, Survey of Information in Literacy Instructional Practices in Academic Libraries. Okay. Okay. Uh, you I guess let me see here, right? Adrian, what's what's your current working title? Adrian, I think Adrian. Adrian. Yes, hi. Yes. Um I'm looking at I'm assessing um I'm assessing the this content, I'm just paraphrasing, as to whether it uh, prepares students uh, for fourth industrial revolution. You're assessing if what? I'm assessing the curriculum, the this curriculum, as to whether it prepares uh, students for the fourth industrial revolution. Mm, okay, that's interesting. I wonder, I wonder how you're going to assess uh, how things like machine learning and robotics uh, come into play, right? I mean, because that's one of the things that the fourth industrial revolution is all about, is it? I mean, uh, okay, that's 
sounds interesting. Do you think it does, though? I mean, if you look at our, I've always thought our syllabus is a bit archaic here, right? But it's, it's, it needs a, a bit of rebounding here, but maybe. Sorry, is it the fourth industrial revolution or the fifth? Uh, I'm looking at fourth okay. industrial revolution. Okay. Is it the fourth? Okay. Uh, hello. Okay. Yes, hi. Yes, uh, I, I think of interest when I heard uh, Adrian. Because I, I was wondering, there's uh, the topic that I chose at first, you know, where you, you, you keep choosing topics and you present to the, to the lecturer and then they say, no, they shoot this one down, another one down, uh, until maybe there's one that they accept. There's one that I chose at first, which I had uh, the passion, okay? Even now, I still, even when I'm doing this one, I still go back to what, what I thought I would do better at first, but I was thought that somebody is doing it. So I thought it's, uh, it's doing it at the University of Zander. So I thought it's, that's what uh, Adrian is doing. <laughs> it's something to do. For me, it was tapping knowledge. That was the first thing that I wanted to do, tapping knowledge on the institution repository to enhance retrieval. I see, okay. So yeah. say, somebody's working on it, so you can't do this, you find, uh, look for another topic. Yeah, I don't know what sort of approach you've, uh, I don't know what sort of approach you've been using when you're looking for topics, but there's, there's easier, I guess it's too late now, but there's easier ways of looking for these things, right? You just, um, in almost each, each and every publication that you come across, you'll find characters like Lighton who will say, uh, future work, right? Future work, mm -hmm. and this is where you find things that you want to work on, right? In almost most of these publications. Not only that, when you're reading up on what people are doing right now, it's very easy to put two and two together and realize to say, well, I, th I think it would be nice and interesting if we looked at things from this particular angle, right? So, um, anyway, it would be interesting to see what what exactly people would come up with. Oh, but what about uh, Alexander? What what sort of, uh, what, what's the current topic or title? What is it? Um, mine, Doc, uh, will be a survey about uh, information literacy instructions. Not information literacy, but the instructions. Information literacy instructions in uh, academic libraries in Zambia. So mm -hmm. I'll be looking at uh, the status. How is it? How are the librarians, uh, you know, practicing information literacy? Uh, of, I mean, conducting information literacy instructions, and is the information literacy instructions incorporated in the school curriculum? Because uh, I perceived that I think it's in any, uh, it's not existing, especially in in most of these uh, new libraries. Um, so this is why how I considered it to be a research problem. Okay, looks like Mrs. Mm. is going to have her hands full. That sounds interesting. Um, yeah. How, how about uh, Euphrasia, what, 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 what's the topic? Of Hello, Doc. For me, yes. Um, location on archival. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes, Doc. I was I was saying that for me, I'm looking at uh, trying to assess the effect of digitization on archival records. That's that's interesting. What what, what effect of digitization? From what perspective? I'm looking at it from the records management perspective. Okay. I see. Um, more specifically, the the accessibility of the digital archival records from, and I'm focusing. I want to investigate it from the national archives. Okay. I, yes. I wonder if national archives is disguising anything. I mean, we had somebody from national archives is it last before last year. Um, but anyways, that's that's interesting. Sounds interesting. What what's what's uh, what I've discovered, which, which I've always thought is quite shocking, if you look at um, 
digitization and archival records is uh, we haven't really taken this serious as a country. Um, so a, a while back, um, I, I know somebody, we invited a radiologist from um, the university teaching hospital. And um, uh -huh. in, as, in as much as our focus, right, when we invited him was for, for us to try and figure out how we can take advantage of data mining to help them, right, make sense out of the, the, um, the, 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 the sort of artifacts that they generate, these, these, these are scans that they work with. It turned out that uh, one of the challenges they have is uh, they don't have uh, an image repository where they can dump these scans. You know how when you go to the hospital at UTH and you you ask to say, okay, well, they take a scan for you. Those scans apparently, they are on CD somewhere. They don't have like a, an archival record where they can dump this. Now, now so, there are people that obviously have looked into this idea of um, image repository, right? Large scale image repository, because we are looking at large scale data here. These scans are quite large in size. But uh, I was thinking that this seems to be a problem, right? Um, not only that, uh, a while back we organized a workshop, a national workshop, where we invited people to participate in. Um, uh, we, we were doing training. I did this with uh, Tuesday. We were doing training, showcasing people how, how how easy it is. Well, I guess it's not that easy, but well, it's easy to get started if you look at the technology part, the top layer of the information, computer-based information system. How easy it is to transition to electronic records, right? There was overwhelming feedback. We had people, almost a hundred plus people that participated, right? And what was shocking is that the vast majority of government institutions were people from government. I actually still using paper-based records. I, I was shocked myself. Now, now, this is the thing. If you go to our head's office, um, by the way, if you want to uh, play back Ernest, Ernest the radiologist, if you want to look at the radiologist, he gave a talk, radiologist, to us to, to a, a course, a postgraduate course that I'm teaching, it's a data mining course. He talks about he talks about the challenges there. If you're interested in that, you might want to look into that. But what, what, what was shocking is, for the Alfresco talk, right? Most of these organizations are using paper-based records, and we know this. If you look at the HODs, if you walk into the HODs uh, office, least HOD at UNSA, you've seen the, the files, right? Now, what I'm saying is, I mean, we, we don't, we're not necessarily practicing what we preach here, not yet, but we're in the process of doing this. If the, the institutions that that are teaching people records management and electronic records management, haven't yet implemented electronic records management, and I see um, Wenda is in the house here. They, it gives you an idea of how bad the problem is, right? I'm surprised that no one uh, so far, I hope somebody is looking into this, but I do hope somebody is thinking of doing this, right? I think there's a lot that can be done there because clearly it's a problem in Zambia, but anyways, that's, that's interesting. Um, how about, uh, I see we jumped, uh, oh, I, we didn't ask uh, Ms. Brenda. How about Brenda? Oh, she's gone off, okay. Uh, Cecilia, what, what, what topic are you working with? What's your current working title or topic? I see Cecilia left as well. I don't know if I'm threatening people by putting them in the spot here, but uh, you feel me, what, what's your topic? Hello, Doc. Yes, hi. Yes, hi. I'm reporting on market, marketing practices in academic libraries in Northern Province. Okay. okay. Marketing yeah. practices yeah. in academic libraries in Northern Province. Okay. okay. I'm sure it's an interesting sure. topic, and I know there are people that are, that are interested in, in, in marketing in the department. That sounds good. Uh, like we're going to have a lot of interesting topics this year. Uh, and I'll, Harriet, I think, already mentioned. Jacqueline? No, I didn't mention the one I'm working on. Oh, yes, I, please, tell I, us. I mentioned the one that was shot down. <laughs> OK, I'm working on um, uh, knowledge sharing and retention in the mining industry. OK. 
no, no. Okay, I see. It sounds sounds interesting. So it's a knowledge management type of problem then that you're looking at, right? Or something. Yes. Like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Jacqueline. I'm looking at um, the role of academic libraries in um, climate change education and awareness in Zambia. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I suppose climate change is. It. I think. Do we not have someone who's looking at climate change from last year? I wonder. Probably not. I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, Judith. Hello. Yes. What? What? What's your topic or, or title? I'm looking at the provision of library services for people with disabilities in Zambia. Yeah, I have a friend of mine. Um, she's a very close friend of mine. Very brilliant. Uh, I I I never really thought that uh, accessibility was such an important. And I know this sounds a bit. It sounds a bit strange or it's a bit harsh. But I never really thought it was such an important area until I became close to her. Right? She's a brilliant person. She lost her sight when she was in the fourth grade or something. But she now works for, uh, uh, she's been, uh, she's been featured on, I guess it's a success story, very, I should call her today, I think. But so, so I, interacting a lot with her, right, your Mugisha, I realized that uh, that's such an important, she works for IBM now, she's paid a lot of money, actually. Most of my friends are paid a lot of money. But, but I realized that, it's such an important thing, and these are things we take for granted. At Oons, I don't think this is something we, and, and not just Oons, I think in Zambia, this is something we don't take seriously. Now, I know this because I've been told that uh, in certain schools, right, if you're someone who's not um, um, uh, able-bodied, for instance, and they want to do a course, let's say in natural sciences, what they do is they suggest to them to go to the School of Education because the School of Education has like a special education department because they don't have the facilities, right? Which is quite sad, really. But I, th I think that's that's nice. That's nice. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's an important topic, I think. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Miss Doreen, what topic or title? What's the working title of your research? I'm wondering if she's still online. I can see the microphone has been unmuted, but maybe I can't, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I can't hear what she's saying. Uh, we'll wait, I guess, hopefully very soon she'll be able to tell us. Uh, Maggie. What's, what's the title or topic of your research? I'm wondering if my connection is still, can you hear me by the way? Maybe my connection is gone now. Let me just check here. Yes, we can hear you, Doc. Oh, oh okay. Uh, so Hello. maybe it's a problem with the, uh, yes. Hello, Doc. Uh, yes, I'm looking watch. at uh, investigating, I'm, uh, I'm looking at uh, the information seeking behavior of visually impaired persons. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering here what, uh, this is interesting. I'm wondering if you thought about uh, where you to go. Oh, hi, Doreen. Can you give yeah, yes, actually, uh, it's a case study. Okay. It's a case study, and I'm looking okay. at, uh, na hello? Yes. Hello? Yeah, I'm looking at uh, Zambia National Library uh, Culture and Skills Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the one that is in Chilenje. Okay. I, I sure. think we have such an entity now. We yeah. have. <laughs> that, that sounds really interesting. It's, it's sure, that's uh, sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Hello, Doc. Yes, Miss Doreen. What's your work inside your topic? Mine, I'm looking at the impact of electronic publishing on collection and development practices of academic libraries of Zambia. Okay, impact of the electronic publishing. This is interesting. Have you thought about uh, 
হ্যালো 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 ইলেকট্রনিক this whole notion of electronic publishing is becoming serious. So I, I think there's, there's obviously a lot to do in that, in that respect. That's great. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Thanks, Master Doctor. Winda, what, what, yeah, what, what's your topic or working title? Uh, I'm working at knowledge uh, management. Hello? Yes, hi. Yeah. I'm also looking at knowledge management, but I narrowed down to knowledge sharing practices at UNSA. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's, that's good. That's it's good. in relation to what you're saying in terms of uh, our publication as UNSA. Um, really, uh, I, okay, we have a policy, yes, that when you publish something, you have to bring it to, thing, to, the, to the library. But then that one is only limited to to master's thesis and also maybe PhD. But then the question is the other type of knowledge that we UNSA generate as an institution. What's the policy? How do we share yeah. that knowledge? So that's what I want to bring out. Right. And by sharing this knowledge, I mean, from perspective of what? Just sharing it within, within UNSA or like sharing it with... with other people out there or something is it uh i, I, I would narrow it down if i if i look at it globally as a chain externally outside the, the institution maybe it will take more time because considering the time but then i'll just look at unza how do we share so that you can how do you share the knowledge within unza to our colleagues so that we enhance performance of the institution okay great yeah i think i think Yeah, knowledge sharing is a problem at UNSA. I mean, I see it myself. I've been at UNSA for, this is my second year. Um, I'm into my third year, actually. And uh, these last couple of years since I joined, I found it extremely hard to identify who exactly to collaborate with because, I mean, you're looking at 854 plus people. You, you go to these UNSA portals, it's hard to find, oh, yes. to find yes. publications that people have done. So, so I think it's an important, it's interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, ah, Ms. Sipo. Sipo. Hello. Yes, hi. Oh, hi. Um, I'm using someone's account. This is Mutenta. Oh, there um, we go. Uh, now we know. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I'm uh, I'm looking at I'm uh, um, investigating whether um, to see whether librarians have got um, interpersonal skills in the provision of reference services and other services in the library. Okay, I see. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I'm trying to think here. So could you could you elaborate more here so give me a scenario of uh, what sort of what, what would you be looking for like by the personal skill you could give me a scenario of let's say uh, a person goes into you mean like from perspective of a person going into the library and they're looking for something is that is that what you're I'm trying to understand more it more it here. involves a, a lot from you know the, it even that is part of it how do people okay. attend to when they come to the library that is oh, one right, right. yes and how do we get to give out these resources what does it need to do do we need to communicate for us to bring out the services the way that it's supposed to be done i see i see interesting stuff this is good so a lot of interesting uh topics here okay uh valet i'm looking at uh, the use of social media to market library services. 
Hmm. Okay. Hello. Yes. Yes. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm listening. I mean, I'm just thinking out yeah. loud. Yeah. I mean, certainly. I mean, it makes sense to target these platforms now. I mean, the the clientele has moved onto social media now. So I mean, you have to think. Okay. Interesting. This is this is going to be really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, it looks like a lot of interesting, interesting uh, problems. It's quite unfortunate that uh, no one has carved out a problem to do with information retrieval, digital libraries, or <laughs> or integrated library management systems. But anyhow, uh, so I'm looking at the time. I'm going to suggest that tomorrow, uh, immediately after the talk by, by Boomba, which is at 17, by the way, the time has changed. 17, not that it's changed, but the time is 17. Uh, Doc, hello? Uh, Mutinta is doing something on Koha, of not Mutinta, Matilda. Yes, fine. Yes, okay. Matilda is doing something about Koha. I think we should be able to cover part of uh, part of uh, what you're saying. Yeah, we, we should we, we interact with her tomorrow if she joins us so that she can tell us a bit more about what she's doing. Thank you for that. For sure. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm looking at the time, it's like 20 hours. I thought it was very helpful. I mean, I figured instead of us using the last remaining minutes to walk through the practical session, I, I thought this was more beneficial than that. So what we can do is, uh, th there was uh, a proposal by someone, I can't remember who, who said uh, maybe we do uh, a brief uh, showcase on how to install before we do a practical walkthrough. We will do that tomorrow. So uh, immediately after the talk, the talk ends uh, somewhere at 17.30, maybe 17.40, somewhere there. Uh, we will transition to our interaction where we will just do a quick walkthrough of this space. I will showcase, I'll walk you through, I'll show you how easy it is to install this space. It's not that hard. And then hopefully by the time we are done, if you are interested in installing this space, you can do this on your own. And then we can maybe also, uh, I can also introduce you to how you use the demo instance because there's a DSpace demo instance that you can use. It's already available in the cloud somewhere. Um, so you can play around with it so that you familiarize yourself with how the platform works. And then hopefully this will also help you prepare for the exam and the tests that we are going to be writing very soon, right? Um, uh, just reading up on the resources may not really be that helpful. Uh, unless there's any specific questions, then I suppose we'll call it a day or a night, and then uh, I'll see you at 17 hours tomorrow then. Unless if there are any questions. Uh, Doc. Yes. Hello. Uh, maybe out of curiosity, I wanted to find out if somebody was to specifically pick out a topic in relation to digital libraries, since that is your area of special uh, speciality. Um, I've, I've heard you mention about three areas, uh, which, which I imagine you talked about the aspect of users, the technical aspect, and the workflow systems. Yeah, so I don't know what your advice would be in that in that line if somebody was interested to pursue that angle of study. Well, I mean, so a, a good starting point usually. Now, people, the way this works, and you see this very soon, right? Once you start interacting with these other colleagues, right? Is um, people will take a different approach. So some some people would. Uh, what some people will do is they'll refine what you propose, right? But what some people will do, like what I, my approach has always been, if, if somebody is interested in, let's say, digital libraries, the first thing we do is together, uh, and, and sometimes some people will think this takes a lot of time, but I, I've always thought it's helpful. Together, we, we narrow down to a specific area, and this involves a lot of reading. So you start reading. Um, and finding a topic is not that hard, actually. Uh, what what is hard is trying to identify what someone is interested in and i think that's very important it's important because it will decrease the odds of you losing interest in what you're doing right so i've always thought that ensuring that someone works in an area that they're interested in is important right so being interested in these libraries is one thing if you look at the digital libraries landscape like, like you rightly put it it's it's so broad, like there's, there's so much to, to do there, right? So would, would, would identify what you're interested in, right? And then narrow down to a particular problem area. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, Hello, Doc. Yes. 
Sorry. Yeah. As you have just said, I'm interested in something to do with the technical skills. Now I don't know how maybe I rephrased my topic. It was rejected, but I wanted something to do with the networking skills of librarians. Right, right, right. So I don't know whether this is too late because like that is where my interest is. I want to, to do something which is technical, technical skills. That is what I want to look at. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's too late, but what we can do is speak to Dr. Kando and find out if, if it is too, it's never too late, I guess, I don't know. Uh, it's possible. Um, yeah, people have, I've noticed, I mean, people have different interests, I mean, also, so, so, yeah, so valid, to, to answer your question, I, I don't know if it's too late, we can, Sorry? we can reach out to Dr. Kando and find out if it's, if it's too late, if it's not too late. I would have to look at, uh, if you can send through your proposal, the one you had, before I can take a look at it and see exactly what it was you were looking at and then. Okay. Okay, I'll do that because I, I wanted to look at the networking skills of librarians because most of the cases, um, the when there is a that. challenge yeah. uh, in the connections in the libraries especially, even the things to do with maybe Disperse, Koha and so on, uh, we don't have that right. technical expertise to maybe to work on the, those issues. That is why I, I wanted to maybe to to do that research so that maybe librarians maybe can be enlightened and maybe they can learn something and we can at least get to to move towards maybe gaining some technical skills. Yeah, you can send through I don't know whether that is still in line because I, can, I was told that was not in line with the, the libraries. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't really sound like a, it's, it's a it's yeah. least centric problem, right? So, uh, but you can send it through. I mean, I can take a look at okay. it. Um, when you have the time, just email it. What I wanted to mention again is what, something to think about is this time you're investing in this is, uh, you should think about what it is you can, what sort of skill set you can acquire once you're done. One year is a long time. You know, so sometimes pushing you to the pushing yourself to the limit so that you try and acquire some new skill might actually be helpful rather than just working on. Uh, now there's different approaches, right? You can work on something that you think is relatively easy, right? Something you can easily do, something that is not very challenging, right? Maybe because your interest is just in the degree itself, which is fine. I mean, if that's your goal, but <clears throat> but also it's important to think about the future. Think if you're, for instance. If you're one of those people who is thinking of maybe at a later stage doing a PhD, the type of master's, the problem that you work on is going to influence where you're going to go and whether or not people are going to be willing to work with you. So these are things to think about, actually, you know. Um, but anyway, I thought this was really nice and interesting. I know Dr. Kahandura is probably going to schedule another interaction very, very soon where I think you do your proposal presentation and I'm very much looking forward to that. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, I'm sure it's going to be online anyway, but it's still going to be interesting nonetheless. Um, so if there are no other concerns, then I guess we'll call it a night and I will see you at 17 hours tomorrow. Um, hello? Yes, hi. Uh, Doc, um... Well, I just want to make a comment in line with uh, uh, Violet Chama's um, comment. Uh, a lot of uh, topics were rejected because uh, Dr. Aka didn't feel like they were in line with uh, this. And yeah. he had reservations about my topic. And um, he, he, he's been pushing me towards uh, doing a research on the information needs of farmers, um, um, information needs of, farmer, uh, of farmers on climate change uh, stuff, uh, which I don't want to do. Um, right. Although we have agreed that I do the topic I'm interested in. Um, that's because I feel that, um, well, I know that librarians, we are the only discipline or one of the disciplines that have access to information about other disciplines. So we are in interdisciplinary in nature in that sense. Yeah. And um, 
I feel that we need to start creating synergies with other disciplines so that we can create opportunities for ourselves, especially even where relevance is concerned. Because right now we have so many things to worry about, like um, electronic publishing or this information, which is now in electronic form, which people can access from their uh, cell phones and other gadgets and devices. So how else do we make ourselves relevant? And I see a lot of issues, emerging issues, like climate change, for example. It's, it's an area I'm passionate about. I would want to see more action from the librarians. So as a starting point, I want to know what it is that we are doing, um, if any, because in you know in, in in while i have been looking at information for this same topic i've realized that we even have a climate change policy which recognizes academia as you know partners in the implementation of climate change in zambia so for me the question is are we doing anything and right. can we get yeah. to, to you know open open up opportunities for ourselves as a profession so that we can also give input on the resource side of things. Yeah, so, so my, my, thinking, my thinking is probably, I mean, the, the reason that Dr. Kandora might be, might have reservations for certain topics is, uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I think key is probably this whole notion of uh, there being somebody who is in a position to supervise you, right? So there's, there's that aspect to look at, right? If you look at our department so far, uh, well, Dr. Moichalimba retired now, is out of the picture, I guess. So this is Dr. Kandelwa, it's uh, uh, Mr. Amoya, it's Mrs. Zulu, it's Lighton, and I mean, that's it, actually. Unless if I've missed out anybody else. Oh, Mr. Njovu, right? So <laughs> usually the way that he the way that you direct students to cover out topics is in line with the interest of people in the department and the capability of people in the department, right? Now, in certain instances, I mean, it's it's it's, it's not uncommon to have people co-supervise, right? So if you're interested in an area where with, the, I guess, perhaps there might not be expertise in the department, I'm sure there are ways of uh, incorporating somebody else from a different unit in the in the university like i i mean i'm supervising someone who is from the computer science department right i'm co-supervising with uh with someone who is computer science right so it's, it's possible right so uh but but i, I don't know i mean it's it, um uh there's there's also i mean there's also room i guess to modify you know research in such a way that it, it's still it, it still has some aspects of what you were originally interested in. It's not, uh, yeah, it's, it can be hard. I mean, I, I don't know. I wish, wish uh, I wish this was done differently. I mean, in other places, so, um, and I don't know if I'm answering your question or if I'm just rambling here, but, but, but uh, so <laughs> when the approach I went through, right, when I was enrolling into a master's program is before you are accepted, you must identify a tentative supervisor, right? So the matchmaking is done before you even start your master's program. And the idea behind that is the department wants to ensure um, that there's already someone on hand who is interested in what you're doing, someone who is in a position to supervise what you want to do. Now, it, it, what you're proposing to do, right, when you're looking for a tentative su supervisor, one of the things they'll do is they'll ask you to propose, to send through like a rough proposal. What you propose to do is not exactly going to end up what you you will do. Um, but the idea is to, to ensure that you identify a person who is in a position to supervise your area of interest. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, there's still room, I guess, for you to modify the study in such a way that it includes some aspect of what you want to do, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Does the University of Zambia allow um, external supervisors, say from a different university? Well, to the best of my knowledge, yes. Oh. Yes, that is. That so, so, I, well, um, so, so there, there. If you look, here's the thing: if you haven't read this document yet, and if you haven't, please bookmark this. Right? Is this very? Uh, I don't know if it's the, the guidelines. 
has anybody downloaded the guidelines for DRGS guidelines? I think the most recent version is from 2017. The the handbook um, it, it kind of outlines uh, supervisors where they come from. A supervisor can can come from industry. Supervisor can come from a different unit. A supervisor can come from a different university. Supervisor. Uh, are you doing termination for? This is a very important document, by the way, a, a document that outlines what you are entitled to when you have a supervisor, the role of the co-supervisor, how examiners are identified. Let's see if I can find. Uh, there's a part which talks about um, the, the way they select a supervisor, for instance, uh, things like the qualification of the supervisor, right? Um, minimum qualifications, that is. So these are important, well, there we go. Uh, procedure for, I would like you to please, all of you, read the beginning page number, it's, it's actually section 12, right? Research supervision. It has details of uh, how many supervisors you are supposed to have, right? This is, this is a model, you're doing what they call a model B, masters, right? The different models. I don't know if you're aware of that. That's the link to, please read beginning page 12. Um, what you're doing, I think, is, is this the model B or something? There is a model, mode. It's a mode, yeah, you're moving in mode B, right? So it's a taught uh, coursework at dissertation. So these different modes of, uh, the, the different kind of rules that apply here, right? So, uh, so they do, I do believe, unless if I've, but in, so there's, there's a procedure that they use for selecting uh, supervisor with like qualifications and uh, it's possible. Okay. Please read that document. If I were you, I'd download it and put it somewhere safe because... Uh, What's the title of the document? It's called uh, 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 Regulations, it, they're called Guidelines, but it's called Regulations for Postgraduate Training. I've tested the link, to the, the direct link to the most recent... Last time I spoke to Dr. Mbozi, who was the previous uh, uh, postgraduate coordinator for the school, she had told me the IDS was in the process of um, making changes. This is a 2015 document, making changes, so there's bound to the new version. But please read that document, very important. It's a short document, just 90, 86 pages. Very short document. But it's quite useful. It's a reference, actually. Some things you only get to read once you start writing a manuscript, for instance. It has specifics like uh, how you're supposed to write that document, reference styles that you use, um, what change your supervisors, right? Change. If you want to change your supervisor, if you feel disgruntled and you feel like uh, the person who is supervising you, you're not happy with them, these things, because they happen, by the way, they're embedded within here. There are procedures that you follow. And these are things that you should, when you have you're assigned a supervisor, you are entitled to one hour of time. So supervision every week, right? So it's a given. These are, and most people don't, this is sad really. Most people don't realize that they're entitled to these things and you just move around. Uh, it's quite sad, I think. You move around thinking that what's handed down to you is what, what uh, is supposed to happen. No. Right? Please read that document. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there are any other concerns. Um, if you want a discussion of the document, once you read it at a later stage, let me know. I'm happy to share my thoughts on this document. Quite nice document, actually. Okay. And a lot of people, uh, I have colleagues that have done uh, uh, postgraduate qualification at UNS. No, supervision is bad at UNS. And I tell him, nah, there are subcultures at UNSA. Supervision style, they're just guidelines that are there. If you work with Lighton, his supervision style is probably going to be completely different from Dr. Kandela's style. Why? The influences are different. Dr. Kandela went to school elsewhere, right? Lighton went to school elsewhere. What Lighton thinks works best when he's working with postgraduate students is different from what Dr. Kandela thinks. For some people, they're left in the deep end, right? You do the things, like I, the same thing happened to me when I was a student, PhD and masters. I had some of my colleagues that, well, the, the, super, the supervision style was different, right? Where you're left to swim on your own. Uh, in my case, it was rigid, whether I liked it or not.
Doc, I can't hear you, but I can see you are moving the document. Oh, so I was talking to myself. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been talking to myself for a long. I'm so sorry. I was, um, <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I was talking about supervision styles and I was saying this. But how long have I been talking to myself? How many minutes? Maybe two. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> I don't know why I muted my, I accidentally mm -hmm. muted this. But I, I'm so sorry for that. But I was saying, um, I was talking about supervision style. The document, key takeaway point is this document is extremely important because it tells you what you are entitled to. You're paying for this service. This, this has been perfected. This has been going on for years now. Uh, what the RDS has discovered is that there are things that go wrong. And so these are safety mechanisms that are in place. So for instance, when you meet with your supervisor, you see this form here. It doesn't have to be this form, but the record has to be put in place. What time did you, when did you meet? What did you discuss? What action points were made? What was the plan, right? Was it face-to-face? -face? Was it video conferencing, right? If, you, if the person is your, is your, if the person is your supervisor, uh, doc, is, yes, hi. Uh, maybe you can start from the part where you said when you were doing your PhD, um, some of your colleagues had different supervisors. Oh, and right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so thanks for that. So I like, I like storytelling. It's nice. It, I, I'm relieving my memory. It was such a nice experience, by the way. But, but uh, so the thing, right? I was in a lab, a lab which had uh, a lot of people. I sat in two different labs, right? And the, the interesting thing about the labs I sat in is that I was interacting with students for, who were supervised by different people, right? Uh, and this site is ICT, ICT for D. I was supervised by different people. Uh, we were supervised by different people. And so part of what we would do is would, uh, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this, ZD would sit and share thoughts. You know how you gossip, right? Uh, <coughs> my supervisor does this. Oh, I don't like my supervisor. He's, uh, he's doing ABCD. So, but anyway, what I picked out was that the supervision style was different, right? There were some, some of my colleagues who, uh, who are left in the deep end, right? Where you know who your supervisor is, but uh, if you don't initiate contact with that supervisor, you never meet with them, right? How, that's the way it was. Um, in my case, though, it was a rigid structure, right? I, I wish I had a, I wonder if I have an MOU. I should show you my MOU, I see for you. In my MOU, every year, right, um, we would, would sit with my supervisor, we agree, this is what you are going to do. This is how things are going to be done, right? Um, but, but, but anyways, that's, that's life. Life is like that, I guess. Um, uh, so don't expect that when you're interacting, if you're assigned Dr. Kandela, don't think that the way you're going to interact with Dr. Kandela is the same way that your other colleague interacting with Mr. Njovi is going to be, like the supervision is going to be completely different, right? Uh, and that's fine because life, I mean, life is like that in my opinion. Um, and if you think about it, if you speak to people, to a person who was supervised uh, maybe in a less rigid way, perhaps they'll be able to bring out uh, aspects that they think were helpful as far as that supervision style was concerned, right? Uh, so anyway, I can't get to this side, but I wanted to show you the, um, uh, it's quite sad, it's not there. I wanted to showcase the, the lab, how large it was. Um, but yeah, so, but please read that document so that you know what you are entitled to. There are certain things like when, because in our, in our department, in almost all instances, you have a supervisor and a co-supervisor. This document will tell you the role of the supervisor and the role of the co-supervisor, right? So you should know who to, to go to in the, in the event that you need something, right? And you only know that once you read this document. It's a short document. I do encourage you to read this document. Um, so, but also, not. I guess I'm rambling here, but in closing, you should. It's all about, in my opinion, it's all about the experience, right? 
Um, and you should really look forward to the experience, the experience of learning from other people. Uh, unless there's any questions, any other questions to do with uh, this? I think I'm rumbling up and down. May, may I leave the room? Yes. Oh, I remember that. And I think I'm going to leave as well. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay, good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>